Welcome and thank you for joining the Q&A for Mac with cinematographer Eric Mezer schmitz production designer Donald Graham Burt and costume designer Trish Somerville, moderated by Jessica Radloff, a West Coast editor at Glamour. Mac has received 10 Oscar nominations, including Best Cinematography, Best Production Design and Best Costume Design. I'm Gwen Diglis, Deputy Director for the American Cinematheque. This conversation is part of the nominee award season conversation at the AC. Please visit our website, americancinematheque.com, where you can find information about our upcoming program and how you can support the American Cinematheque by becoming a member and making a donation. Enjoy. First of all, Gwen, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, to Donald, Eric, Trish, congratulations on the Oscar nominations. I am so thrilled for you all, Eric and Trish. I know this is your first one, so that is extra special. I'm sure as Donald can attest to. Very special. I'm very happy for both of them, especially. I'm happy for all of us. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. Ex exactly. I'm never happy for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm happy for all of you guys, and I'm happy we can be here for the Mankathon. Who knew we would be involved in a Mankathon, probably, when you were making this movie? <laughs> but I love that we get to do it. So anyway, talk to me first about what your early discussions were like with David about the visual look for Mank, and what gave you the most trepidation and what you were most excited about when you were just beginning the pre-production process? Whoever wants to jump in first and tell me what that was like. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first if that's okay, because I started the project first, actually. So David came to me very early on, and um, we were actually prepping another project that postponed, and he told me about Mank and gave me the script, and I read it. And of course, I was extremely excited about it. But one of my early conversations with him was something that resonated with me as I worked on the whole project. And it was in his office when we were alone. And I know that Eric and Trish, I have told this to him many times, but we were just standing there and it was, sim it was a very simple conversation. It was David saying, you know, I want the film to feel like it was made in that period. And I want it to be as if you're in a film vault and you're looking and you see, oh, there's Citizen Kane. And then right next to it on the rack, you see, Mank, what is this? It's sort of the forgotten film that was made at the same time about the same subject. And so that's something that stuck with me all the way through. And in terms of the broader context of, you know, a direction for the film, <clears throat> it was wanting to be a film that felt and looked like it was made during the 30s. And it absolutely does. You did an extraordinary job. I, I can't wait to jump in and ask you all yeah. the details. Um, Trish, how about you? What were those early conversations like with David? Pretty much the same. I mean, it was always the the conversation of having it look like it was a film that was made in the 1930s and having it be very authentic and very real and not over the top Hollywood glamor for glamor's sake. Um, and then how the approach would happen to do it in black and white. Love that. Eric, what scared you the most going into this? I, you know, I was worried. I, I, I... I felt like the, that sh shooting a film in black and white could quite easily become a parody of itself. And I was very conscious of the idea of like making sure that the, that the imagery was authentic and it was, and it was appropriate for the story. And it wasn't being, it, you know, that we were, we were, pro we were on the correct side of the line in terms of, of, uh, technique and and style and homage and not not getting too too far beyond pastiche and into parody you know so I was I was concerned about that and and I wanted to be as responsible as possible you know to the to the the canon of black and white photography and and black and white cinema in general so you know it was, yeah I was super conscious of that of course I was reading an interview that you did and I loved the quote that you gave. You said, I came out of the movie never wanting to work with color again. 
<laughs> it's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, but I I didn't miss color for a second when we were working. In fact, you know, it's like all of my memories. We were talking the other day. It's like all of my memories from the movie are in black and white, which is kind of a bizarre thing. But I yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember what dawn sets look like or 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 trisha's costumes what colors they were you know because it was so focused at the time in terms of what we were doing I, I i only remember that period of my life in black and white which is kind of funny yeah wow that's such an interesting uh observation that you had from it and donald i think i read too that you when you were dealing with certain props you did a you used an iphone filter in order to make sure it was authentic to the period. So talk about some of the little tricks and things you did in order to make sure it was authentic through a different filter or lens than you would normally see in a color film. Right, you know, we, you know when we were sort of evaluating how to deal with the color in black and white, and we did some testing, and I know that Trish did a lot of testing as well as the art department with Eric, and Eric can attest to this, that. You know, there was a certain point where David sort of standardized things and it was kind of a quiet moment that everything kind of came together when he said, let's just photograph things in the noir filter on the iPhone and everybody will be on, have the same language. Everybody will be using the same standard. And so props and set dressing and construction and myself with paint, we all started using the noir filter. And it was interesting, the more we used it, <clears throat> the more sort of black and white became became the language that we were speaking. And it, you know, it was just a natural sort of creative, you know, reaction to things that we would have that we inherently knew from doing all the photographing with the noir filter, you know, it became second nature to us. And that's a good place to be, I think, where it becomes instinctive, you know. Wow, I love that. And, and Trish too, that kind of goes with the costumes because I mean, the costumes are just so beyond gorgeous, but what was it like for you in terms of fabrics and colors? What did you find that worked really well that maybe was a surprise? And what did you find that maybe wasn't gonna work as well as you had hoped in black and white? Early on, we figured out that, um, I mean, of that period, especially in women's clothing, there was a lot of prints and a lot of patterns and a lot of bold colors, um, which the bold colors do translate nicely into black and white and shades of grays um, to give you tone. But as we all know, we didn't want to we didn't want to, you know, see all this bright color on set with our with our naked eye and just wanted to see what it was going to be like on the monitor and on screen. But the thing that I really found was patterns were a big issue in black and white. If you didn't do it in a proper tone, like a tone on tone kind of pattern or print, it really popped and became very, very vibrant and really, really busy. So in the beginning, I would just go to rental houses and kind of line up a lot of costumes and step back and, and photograph them in the noir setting and then immediately could decide what we wouldn't use. And so that helped us when we started to look for fabrics because we, we built most of probably 90% of all the principal clothing. So it just really helped kind of give me direction into what I knew I could use as far as patterns and prints. And as Don did mention, it was you know, once you started using this app, you kind of did see everything that way. And so my assistant, Corey and I would have these kind of conversations. <laughs> I would so show him a picture of something and he would jokingly be like, that's light blue. Like we could tell from a black and white photo what color it would be in real life and vice versa. So it was really, it was really, really useful. And I'm glad you mentioned that you did 90% of the costumes because you and I were in a previous panel a couple months ago and you told me something fascinating that I would not have realized, which is a lot of these costumes would not have held up from that time period to today. Um, was that something you automatically knew uh, or that surprised you? Um, did you really think you were gonna be making 90% of these uh, costumes for the film? Well, we did, we did end up making more than I anticipated because we also made uh, basic pieces for the background as well, because as you mentioned, yes, it was, you know, you're looking at clothing that's, you know, about 90 years old. And so if it is still around, it's not in the greatest of shape. And there are a lot of rental houses and collectors that have things. But yeah, I mean, it's also, you're talking about our body shapes are much different now than what they were then. So it just, for us and like the, the need that we had, it was more important for me to make 
all, you know, as much of the, as much of the principal clothing as I could. And that's kind of my happy place. If I can build everything, I want to build everything. Just a lot of times it will depend on actor availability or budget um, and, and time frame. So it was nice to build pretty much everything we could for the principals. I mean, we didn't build shoes because that's a really, that takes a lot of time. So we lucked out with finding either reproductions of shoes that worked or real period shoes that worked. That's amazing. Um, Eric, something that I found really fascinating too, as I was doing a deep dive into the film was that a lot of the nighttime scenes, you guys, you filmed it in the daytime. So I'm thinking specifically of one scene where we have Mank and Marion outside with the monkeys and everything. And that, that was shot, it was a nighttime scene, but you shot it in the daytime, right? So tell yeah, me yeah. what that was like. We, we did a lot of testing. Well, you know, I had done, it's, we, we, it's a technique we call day for night and it's a, it's a classic cinema technique and it, it um, it, it goes back to the beginnings of cinema. Um, and it was something that I had actually done. Uh, I, I was shooting the TV series Raised by Wolves for Ridley Scott. And he, he had instituted this system of shooting day for night in this, uh, on this TV show. And, and I had sent David some stills of what we were doing. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, and David thought it was really cool, you know, and we, we took it and, and this particular scene in the film, yeah, the, the Mank and Marion walk and talk through San Simeon was challenging. And, you know, we, the audience needed to appreciate the scope of uh, First Castle. And they ha ha it was important to us that they understood how expansive the space was. Mm -hmm. And the locations that, that Don had found um, were fantastic, but logistically complicated to light practically. Um, at least in terms of appreciating what we were trying to um, translate to the audience. So uh, David said, well, what if we do the day for night thing? You know, let's just do it. Let's shoot him at, and shoot him during the day. Uh, and I thought, I thought, well, great. Yeah, sure. I just, I just have been doing this for six months. Totally. Let's do this. And we did a series of tests and, and it was interesting in, in, in the, as, as we got into the testing process, um, one of the things that's complicated about day for night work is that uh, it, it essentially, in layman's terms, you drastically underexpose the camera. So things are very, you, you deliberately make it exceptionally dark. Um, what that does is it makes everybody's faces really dark. And so we have to add all sorts of artificial light to the actor's faces. And we did some tests where we did exactly that. We were, you know, out in the studio shooting, uh, Gary and Amanda, day for night, heavily underexposing the scene and adding lots of extra light to their faces. And Gary came up to me after the test and he said, man, I, I don't know if I can do this, you know? Um, and Gary is game for anything. I mean, Gary is like totally up for anything. And, and so when he came to me, he said, I don't know, uh, because it was, it was so bright in his face that he was squinting, you know? So we actually had uh, some custom contact lenses made for Gary and Amanda that they could wear that were tinted like sunglasses so that they wouldn't look like they were squinting when we shot that sequence. So uh, yeah, it was heavily prepped and tested. and It was quite exhaustive. Uh, it was quite an exhaustive process, but you know, something that Don and, and David and I spent a lot of time with, you know, looking, making sure that the, the light fixtures were in the right place and that the, we were shooting in the right locations at the right time when the sun was where we wanted it, et cetera. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of work went into that, the, that scene. And, uh, but it's, it's something uh, I'm, I'm proud of. I mean, we, we worked incredibly hard to make that work for sure. Yeah. And I think the other thing to add, if I might, is that <clears throat> we were at a location, we were spread out all over the place at Huntington Gardens on that. And there were a lot of, yeah. decent size moves to pull that off so yeah you know I think the lighting and grip team especially needs to be commended for their work on that for oh. sure for sure yeah it was a huge yeah. team effort yeah yeah because you guys could not film at the Hearst Castle so you basically had to recreate all of this which is just exceptional um <laughs> was that a was that a very challenging undertaking for you Donald um, it was, but you know, the thing is, we just simplified it. We just looked at it and said, okay, we're in this room, we're in the dining room, we're doing the mayor birthday party, we're in a gathering par parlor, and then we're doing this 
sequence outside that was broken down into three or four scenes and you know w- once you break it down and you realize okay this isn't so bad you know I mean it was a challenge in the sense that we shot at Huntington Gardens for most of the exteriors and we needed to add some hardscaping some stone walls some iron work to make it work and to give it a sense of opulence but we really just looked at the research and we said what are the key elements that we keep seeing repeated from Hearst Castle? And we just simply bring those in and, and don't, try to, don't try to bite off too much. And I think that's kind of what helped us on it all. You know, keep it simple. This is why you all are Oscar nominees. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very impressed. Um, Trish, we have to talk about the white circus outfit that Marion wears, which is just, Unbelievable. I want to know how you conceived of that. And then also something that I that I found really fascinating as well was I think it was you, Eric, you had not even seen that costume, right? When when Amanda walked in and then you wanted to light her a certain way because of it. So walk me through that scene. Let's start with you, Trish, just how you came up with this most gorgeous, luxurious look for Marion. There's, a, there's quite a lot of um, photos of the, the Hearst parties and they did do a circus party and that's where we came up with the costumes for it. So with Marion, um, we kept her pretty true to what the photographs were of her costume and just kind of improved on the fit, improved on the fabric and the details. And as well as Hearst was, you know, he was very close to what he wore as well. With, with Marion, intentionally throughout the whole film, I kept her clothes very light in tone. I wanted her to kind of be the thing that always stood out um, and have a lot of sheen to some of her fabrics, especially in the evening scenes. And I did tell Eric she'd be wearing white, but I don't think it was, I mean, it was a thing of where the costume wasn't done until probably the morning of or the day before. And uh, when Amanda had come in to do a check fit with it, um, we were trying to decide the size of this hat. And I remember she said to me, I was like, oh, I might scale the hat down a little bit. And she said, no, I don't have any lines in this scene. We need the big hat, you know? So it was really funny that she was really game for, yes, I wanna be, I wanna be flashy in this scene. And, you know, I sit there and I don't say anything. And, you know, she chose to kind of keep adjusting her hat in the scene, but um, yeah, it was, it was figuring out something that would catch the light nicely. and you know, working with Don early on and seeing what, what he was doing, how he was dressing that that room and what tone the room would be and how dark or light it was gonna be. Um, and then where she was gonna be positioned at the table. Um, it was trying to make her be the lightest thing in the room. That's amazing. So Eric, Sorry, talk Eric. <laughs> Eric, talk to me then about how you wanted this whole scene to look, especially with Marion Lit the certain way. And I think you said that you wanted Mink to orbit around her. Yeah, well, you know, we we had lit most of the of the interiors at, at St. Simeon with this castle, you know, top light, very underexposed, you know, dim. It, it was meant to feel, you know, David, I remember he said, he said it should feel musty, you know, and a musty is a smell, right? So it's like, okay, so how do we make it look musty but uh we you know we it's it's not with it's not lit with a tremendous amount of flare intentionally it's it's lit very sort of in this in a, in a very cavernous way and then amanda walked out and she walked into the set you know and they rehearse you know when when, when actors rehearse they're they're in their they're in sweat pants and pajamas and they're like you know it's not their hair is is sort of half done and then they go off for an hour or whatever and we work for so I hadn't seen it, um, which was rare. I mean, typically with Trish, you know, like Trish and I would text constantly and she'd send me what the actors were wearing and what the fedora was look like. And what like, you know, it's like a big thing for cinematographers, like is the fedora tipped here or is it tipped here? Because it affects the lighting, you know? And we were constantly in communication. Um, but but yeah, Man- Amanda walked in, in, in that costume and uh, I remember being completely starstruck. It's like the first time on the movie. It was like, oh wow, okay. And and I yeah, I, I I went and grabbed David, and you know we did like the kind of initial lineup of you know the actors walk in, and there's a time schedule. You know everyone's stressed about time, 
and the actors all walked in in costume and Gary was just as Gary has been the entire movie essentially, you know, and then in walks Amanda and, uh, and I said, okay, uh, give me five minutes, you know? Um, and, and we lit her, um, quite deliberately, uh, you know, and it's, and it didn't take much, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like bring in the arc lights and it was like, just because she was already what Trisha dressed her in was already so luminous and her makeup and, you know, and, and, and Amanda in general is, is a, is like a, a beacon as a human being. So it doesn't take very much, but it was just a little bit of added light to her, uh, created, made, made her the center of, of this, of the scene. Um, and it was, you know, it's a momentary, it was the obvious decision to make, but it was, it was not, it was one of those things that we just decided to make at the last minute, you know. It was really so gorgeous, Trish. And um, and I also want to call out Lily's costumes as well, because even though they are not as flashy as what we see Amanda in, they are so beautifully tailored and just absolutely gorgeous. I was looking at them thinking, gosh, I would love to wear some of this even today. They were so beautiful, everything that Lily was in. Well, thank you. I mean, with, with her character, it was a lot of... Um, you know, making her be very English, very prim and proper, and then kind of letting her loosen up as she develops this friendship with Mank and eases into what her role is with him. And, and at one point I kind of mimicked them a little bit with the sweaters and then the trousers that she wears and the sporting shirts. But I just really wanted to show um, this kind of, you know, like ease and casualness that they had between each other as their relationship developed. But with, yeah, with Lily too, her frame is quite petite. So I didn't want to do anything that was overwhelming on her. And then just showing with the blouses, lots of little details and little stitches. But yeah, she was also really fun to dress. I bet she was. Donald, talk to me also about the 1934 election night sequence. You filmed that in downtown LA, I believe. Um, what were some of the challenges of doing that? And, and Eric, feel free to jump in too, because I know you worked both very closely on that entire scene, but what was that like? Because again, in addition to the circus scene, that was another just stunning, beautiful setup. Yeah, that was, um, we actually filmed that in the Cicada Club, which used to be the old Rex. Um, and actually in the day, it was a men's store. Um, so we came in and we built we built the stage and we brought in the, the lights and, you know, it wanted to be a little more celebratory and theatrical and what it was. Um, and I think that we kind of heightened that a bit, wouldn't you say, Eric, in terms of sure. the styling of it and so forth. It was very deco, the place. It was upscale. It felt like the place where the Republicans would go to celebrate. Um, and, you know, my memory of that, quite honestly, more than anything, was the fact that we only had the space for two days to get it all ready. And it was such a challenge to pull that together. Um, but, you know, I think the whole tone of the scene wanted to be sort of this kind of rich, opulent, upscale group of people that were <clears throat> celebrating an event that they sort of knew what the outcome was going to be. Yeah, that's, that's probably the location you and I went back to the most, I think, Don. I think so. It I was, it was, spent it the was, most time there. Yeah. It was hard because, you know, it was, uh, even though that space may feel big when you first walk into it, by the time you bring in the tables and the actors and the equipment and everything to do it, just the physicality of pulling it off. I mean, I remember they closed on a Saturday night. It was right during the the height of the holiday season. So it was, all our locations were challenged in terms of prep and wrap and everything. Um, they closed on a Saturday night and they said I had it for two days. And I said, okay, I wanna be in there at 12.01 Sunday morning to start my prep. And sure enough, that's when we started. And I, we went straight through for 48 hours to get that ready. But, you know, we brought in, we brought in a lot of, you know, Eric and I talked about having some um, some frosted screens, some glass screens to light through to give it some depth because, you, you know, when it's just an empty space and you're looking at it and when we scouted it together, we realized it, this needs some more dimension to it and it needs light dimension. That's what it really needed. Wow. Don, Don did some early renderings of that scene and the movie, the, the, 
shots in the film look very much like his renderings. It's it's uh, it's it's pretty neat to see actually. Like the you know, I I mean actually in in a way the the film uh, in a large part looks looks very much like all of Don's early art <laughs> early early artistic renderings. So it's it's nice to see it that way, you know. Even down to like the smallest detail that I know, like we know, but the, you know, the the monitoring of the melting ice sculpture <laughs> was was also a huge a huge thing during shooting. The elephant, the GOP elephant, elephant. yes, and how it melted away. Mm -hmm. Perfectly. <laughs> Nothing symbolic about that, huh? Nothing symbolic. <laughs> Before we get to the audience questions, by the way, Trish, I want to ask you really quick about Manx, uh, his suits, because I think you said that Gary would want to have a lot of change or things in his suits to make him walk differently, unless I'm making this up, but, but tell me about that in order to really kind of weigh down the suits in little tricks or little Easter eggs you did um, just to make Manx uh, costumes and look feel really authentic to the time. With his with his suits, I mean, we needed him to also stand apart from all the other gentlemen that are in the film because of that period, you know, there wasn't a lot of variance in what you what you wore to work, depending on what type of job you had and what you wore in your daily life. And so, you know, giving him his characteristics of, you know, a lot of we, we call it like breakdown or aging and dying in in the costume department. So the breakdown on his suits, besides the fabrication of what we made them out of, the breakdown was really important for me and also really important for Gary. Like Eric said, Gary's up for anything. You know, I mean, he's one of the few actors I've worked with that really does want to wear the old period shoes, even if they don't feel great on his feet, he wants to wear them. And, you know, that kind of came up when he has that running scene on the back lot to chase Mary. And that was one of the times we switched his shoes out because he really did run that whole time. So, but with his suits, it was a lot of, the look I wanted it to have was that his suits were very lived in. You know, I, in my head, his wife, poor Sarah, starts him off prim and ready for the day. And once he leaves the house, it's out of her control. And, you know, he goes to work and he's drinking and he's gambling and who knows where he is all day long and he's in this suit. So it's like, I wanted it to appear that he's sweating through his clothes, that his suits are really, really worn. He's not a, a fashionable man. So he probably doesn't have very many suits in his closet and his best suits are probably his funeral slash wedding suit. So we just aged his stuff down, kept it clean, but really aged it down, did a little bit of nicotine and sweat stains in his collars. Um, and I would put things in his pockets, like when we're, when he's not wearing them, we weighed it down with a bag or sacks of beans or rice and that helps and you and you wet it you wet the clothes and so that helps them get this weightiness in the pockets and this relaxed feel of you know of it being an older suit and then it was um when he's wearing it giving him like from don's trocadero we had little match matches matchbooks so we put those in his pocket and crumpled up cigarettes with tobacco and some change or keys like things he could just have you know, that kind of helped him. You don't really see them, but it was a nice character thing for him to have in his pockets. But even in the, the you know, the scenes um, when he's convalescing, it's, we did cigarette burns in his, in his night shirts because he's smoking in bed all the time and did little stains on him there. So he was a really great sport and would come up with like, oh, maybe I can have this, you know, he'd have little things he wanted to have. So yeah, he was, he was great to work with and, and really understood the importance of his costumes. I love that. All right, we got 12 minutes for audience questions. So let's see, let's see how many we can get through in a speed round here. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, let's start with you. Does a character ever inspire your shots? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you're, you, you know, we are, we are, we're capturing human behavior, you know? So yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I mean, we don't decide the shot before we see what the actor is doing. So, uh, of course, you know, um, particularly with David, I mean, it, you know, we, David gives the actors a uh, uh, tremendous amount of time to work through the scene and figure out where the scene uh, should live and, and how their characters should, should interact with each other and, and how they should interact with the camera, you know, and, and the camera is, um, is, is, a, is as much as an, an unobtrusive observer in the scene as possible, but it's still, it's still a participant 
in the in the conversation from the actors you know so um you know we asked the actors to be aware of the camera in terms of of, of hitting marks and, and and acting within the box to, to, to so to speak but um but yeah of course i mean you know we're uh considerate of, of what's happening on the stage you know and then the best and we take the best approach possible to capture that hopefully you know um hopefully successfully you never know but yeah and another question for you i believe i know the answer to this it says film or digital it was digital right it was digital we shot digitally yes okay um for trish and donald how did you incorporate color into the set and costumes for a film that is not in color um, well, I think, again, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about with the noir settings, it was figuring out so we could have a, a variance of tone. And I didn't use, I didn't use very, I used very, very little white at all besides Amanda's character. And I used hardly any black um, because it just went away and absorbed too much light. So it was just, it really figuring out like what, what color palette I needed to get, you know, to get every shade in between white to black. Yeah, for the sets, it was really, I mean, for me, the challenge was just to keep them real looking and not try to paint them, you know, in colors that we knew photographed well in the noir setting. But if the actors came in and it was a pink set or a green set, you know, it'd be so distracting. So, you know, for us in the art department, it was about finding those neutrals that really worked well under the, the filter so that it could feel real. I see a lot of questions about Citizen Kane, and I am curious, you know, how much did you want to watch Citizen Kane again when you were brought on to this film? How much did you want to almost stay away from it so it wouldn't inform you too much? Um, whoever wants to, to start with that one, tell me about uh, the Citizen Kane aspect. How many times did you watch it? Did you not want to watch it? Um, what was that like? I watched it once just to refresh and, um, but you know, when it came to the scenery, we weren't doing, we weren't making Citizen Kane. We were making our own film and our own film was more real, I think. I mean, my take on Citizen Kane is that it's a bit more theatrical. Would you guys agree with that in terms of yeah. Yeah. You know, how it's executed and so forth? And I think primarily that's because Orson Welles was a theater director actually. Um, when he first got into the entertainment industry. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, for me, it was, it was just a point. Of, I mean, there were certain things that we, you know, that we used that were devices that paid respect to Citizen Kane. And the last scene when Hearst walks um, Mankiewicz out of Hearst Castle and they go down the hallway, we did have mirrors on each side of the hallway, much like they did in Citizen Kane to create that, that infinite, <clears throat> reflection that happens when you see one mirror bouncing into one directly across from it but it wasn't something and correct me if I'm wrong Eric I don't think it was something that we intentionally tried to um to focus on I think if it was something that occurred it no occurred. yeah yeah if it it's no there, I, I think it was it happens, more it happens yeah 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 I mean there's moments you know the the, the bottle drop and the yeah. No globe drop obviously is an homage. There's there's pieces, but I think it's I think the film is is look, I mean Citizen Kane is entirely its uh its locations are so different from our film's locations that mm -hmm. the and, and those locations uh ostensibly drive the, the aesthetic. So um, at least in terms of space and, and understanding space and articulating space visually. And so, um, you know, our film takes place in, it's, it doesn't take place in a Thatcher Memorial Library. It doesn't take place in, in uh, you know, there's moments in, in San Simeon or, or Xanadu or however you want to articulate it, but, it, but it's, it's so different. Uh, our film is so different from Citizen Kane structurally that, uh, you know, we, we look to it, at least in my case, simply as a as an inspirational piece of work to look to and and it wasn't at all a you know a emulation or or a replication you know um it, it no, was more yeah. of a of an homage i think yeah yeah there, there was no 
no desire to replicate it in any way, shape, or form from my end of things. No. You know. And I have to say, I looked more at um, photographs of Orson Welles while directing to kind of get a sense of feeling for his clothing than doing anything kind of what was in the movie. It was more of him, you know, in, in like photographs of him or on vacation, which he seemed to enjoy quite often <laughs> and with a lot of leading ladies. Yeah, it was more looking at photographs of him outside of, outside of being in the film. Trish, I have a good question for you here. What was the most problematic costume to get just right? Ooh, um, well, I will say, you know, that gold lame dress, um, I'm, I'm very grateful as, you know, we all are grateful for our teams and our crew that we have. I had a, a brilliant uh, cutter fitter named Marilyn Madsen. And, um, you know, I really wanted the dress to be this kind of antique gold lame. And when we found the fabric, um, there was only so much yardage of it. And I thought, okay, we'll be okay with one, one, we'll try one dress. Um, and it, it, it is quite tricky to sew, LeMay, it shows everything. So you have to kind of do it perfectly. Um, we do a thing called a toile first, which is a similar, probably less expensive fabric. Um, and you make the, the dress out of that first. So you can do all your test fittings with that. And then once the fittings are perfect, then you move into the, the real fabric that you're gonna make the gown out of. And, um, and so uh, it was trying to figure out the thing of being interior and then moving to exterior where, you know, as Eric was saying, we were shooting day for night um, and making sure it still had this really nice reflective quality, but that it didn't, you know, just explode and go too bright and, um, or just get completely flat. So I did take the fabric before making the dress out into the moonlight to see what it would look like. And then we'd have it in different lighting in the office and just kind of test it and shoot it on the camera in different lights to just make sure that it kind of reacted the way I wanted it to react. And, you know, um, the fittings went great and Amanda's, you know, she's so lovely and was just really excited about the dress. And, you know, as it's, and I know what the scene is. And then, you know, then Dave throws out something like, oh, well, I should probably take her shoes off. And I said, oh, okay, so, She'll be barefoot then. He's like, yeah, she'll be barefoot. She'll take her shoes off. And maybe maybe Gary will carry her shoes because she also grabs this bottle of gin, right? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. So I thought I wanted to be able to have the height, the length of the dress, but that if she's going to have her shoes off, that changes it. So I put a loop on the train so she could have the train on her wrist. And then, you know, and then he's like, and then she just jumps up on this fountain and starts walking. And I was like, she's going to jump up on a fountain, you know? And so that was kind of where I got a little like nervous about it. And, um, but Gary being like the, you know, ever present gentleman really helps her. But one of the things Amanda did was uh, she would sit in the scene, she would sit on her feet at times in between to boost herself kind of up. So I ran around and was grabbing things and shoving them under the seat cushions of the sofa so I could raise her so she wouldn't sit on her feet. And at one point at one of the end of the nights when we're shooting, you know, I go to get the dress out of the, out of the truck and it just has this like giant just heel slash down the back of the, of the back of the dress. So that night we had to replace the whole back panel of the dress. And then the next day I was like, please don't sit on your feet. <laughs> please don't sit on your feet. Cause we didn't have any more fabric left. We had enough to do mm -hmm. like one more back panel and that was it. <laughs> so that one was a little stressful. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Wow, just incredible. Um, okay, really quick, I'm gonna try to get through two more super fast here. Um, Eric, did you work with vintage lenses and what were the go-to focal lengths for the majority of the shoot? We didn't, we worked with modern lenses, but we did a tremendous amount of testing. So we looked at, uh, boy, two dozen different sets of lenses at least. Um, and we were, we were looking for very specific things. We wanted lenses that would perform extremely well at, at very deep stops. So it, where the iris is really closed down because we were interested in, in, uh, in, in shooting the film in, in what we call deep focus where the most of the scene is in focus, which is a very, it's, a, it's an homage to Citizen Kane, something that, that Wells and Toland had done. Um, and the other thing we were interested in was flare. And, and it was something that we had explored a little bit when David and I had done Mindhunter together. We were experimenting with different types of digital flare and we were interested in using flare as a storytelling tool and as a, as a, as a way to place the audience in the time period. Uh, but unfortunately, modern lenses don't flare particularly well because all of the engineering has gone towards eliminating that. So we were, we were in this two diametrically opposed situations where we wanted 
the characteristics of, of vintage lenses, but we want wanted the quality and resolution of modern lenses. So we went with modern lenses uh, and we shot on, on the Leica, Leica Simulex lenses. Uh, and we shot primarily on the 25, uh, uh, 21, 25 and 50 millimeter lengths. Um, and, uh, and we, and we did most of our flare work digitally after we did a tremendous amount of testing and with the help of visual effects and um, matte painting, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's a combination. Sorry, that's kind of an esoteric answer, but, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of testing that went into that. Amazing. Um, last thing, Donald, uh, what has been, or what is your favorite era to work in? Oh, gee. That's a hard question. I think every era has something about it that's, you know, that's interesting. So, I mean, you know, the wonderful thing about Mank for me was that it was the early years of filmmaking and it was the early years of Los Angeles, actually. And, you know, I love the film industry and I love Los Angeles so much. And, you know, to be able to work on a project that had both of those, you know, that came together, it was, you know, it was just something that I truly cherish. So. I love that. Last thing, um, something else that I, I was reading in an interview that Eric did. Eric, you said that this movie in particular really brought all of you so much closer mm -hmm. together. So how did you each depend on each other um, to really, just as a support system and working through this because it is, it's just such a gorgeous film, but I know it wasn't easy. So what made this project so special um, for all of you, particularly. All right, boy, you want me to go? Oh, sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think this this project for me in particular was one where I really felt like at least the three of us were going in the same direction, and we could call each other at any time of day, and like you know, it was like I remember definitely moments where I was. I was frustrated or I didn't know if I was making the right choice and I was concerned about the choices I was making and like Don was always there Trish was always there to like you know six in the morning at the studio or whatever you know um eating a breakfast burrito trying to figure out whether or not the the dailies were what we wanted um so yeah for me I mean I feel incredibly grateful to everybody that, that we were all in it together and um you know really proud of the work we did together because it's not often that you're that close to people so and that you that everyone is working towards the same goal so yeah it's yeah. For, for me it's fantastic yeah and it's not often that you're close to three nice people mm -hmm. that's the important thing too I think Trish and Eric are so kind and so nice to work with that yeah. you know I think that makes it extra special I, I think yeah I mean I'm, I'm gonna say all it's all of that it's it's you know, we've all been on projects where you feel like you're the only one that really, really, really cares, you know, but on this, it's, you know, everybody really cares and, and cares for each other. And, and, you know, everybody's kind of like this team player. If like, you know, you're struggling with something, you have somebody you can talk to about it. And if I'm questioning, you know, any, like any of my costumes or, you know, Don's very, very giving with information. I can go early on to him in his office and just, he lets me go through everything to see where he's at. And with Eric as well, I mean, it's, you know, helping, if I really want something, he'll help me figure out like how he can shoot it. Or if I want something to be seen that may not get seen, you know, I think that's, you know, that's what I find is great about this group of people is that we do have each other's back and we will help, you know, you don't just stay in your own department. You're willing to help each other out. Right. And, you know, and I mean, we all then now have a shorthand pretty much with each other and with Dave. So when you say, oh, okay, Dave's going to want this, like we all kind of know what that's going to be. You know, it's not, it's not um, a guessing game anymore. I think we all, and I think that's kind of going back to maybe part of the thing with Eric, with the, with Amanda's costume. I, at some point, I don't even show Dave fitting photos anymore. It's just, you're on this roll and it's, there's this trust. And so, you know, it's like, I'm sure I just forgot like, oh, well, Dave saw it, it's like Eric saw it, like, and you know, you forget because you're just all working so closely all the time that things, you know, you don't have to check in every day because you know, everything's gonna be fine and supported. Yeah, and I think, you know, all the teams on this film in particular, uh, 
especially on this film, the experience of it, where all the teams and all the crew were really on board with what the picture was and had a great spirit about them all. You know, I know with my department, I know I'm working with the lighting department and, and the grips, you know, it, it bled down. It wasn't just the keys, you know, and, and it's always nice. You know, it's always nice when the, the guy that sweeps the stage floor is enthusiastic about the project that he's working on. And he, he kind of has an understanding of what it's all about. Well, I can't thank you all enough. Oh. Trish, this was our second time getting yeah. to do one of these panels. I adore you. Donald, Eric, I feel like you could be my friends. You really do feel, <laughs> really do when you say they, these are a great group of people and so friendly. You guys really are. I'm so thrilled for the nominations. You deserve them all. Fingers are crossed uh, for the end of April.